part, you never want none. none. The beef starts, beef starts, and when I'm out, run. run. I don't get down with stitches and the crooked shady bitches that want to give you the stitches just to live. And welcome to Breakup Gaming Society, home of America's least responsible board game group. I'm your host and founder, the great unclean one, joined by Brendan Costello of Unsheft. Brendan, how are you, man? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I, I, I need you to help settle something. I got a call from a friend just before this that I'm kind of weirded out of. You know one of these things you do that is common to you and you think everybody does, but people don't do? I, what I, I want like, to know, uh, I feel like this conversation could get weird really quickly. <laughs> I, I just want to know, is it, is it weird if you have uh, the Frito-Lay complaint number on your starred contacts? Uh, no, it's not. And I'm going to tell you why. Uh, Fritos are complex and you got questions sometimes, you know, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta be ready to, uh, you gotta have somebody on the, uh, on the phone ready to answer those questions, those Frito based questions. Are, are you listening to this at Endurable Goods? I'm not a freak. You're a freak, because yep, because sometimes I will find one of those little che- those little Cheetos, you know the ones that they're 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 smaller than standard and they're sort of ossified. They're 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 almost like dentist <laughs> stone. You know what I'm talking about? Because when I find I do, one of those, I do. I think it's funny that this is this this is so relatable right now. I think you have you had chefs on before. Or is this just like a natural ability knowing how to? how to get them intrigued with the conversation i i just thought i just up until no my i'm i'm my head's kind of fucked right now up until 10 minutes ago i thought everybody in america just would naturally be able to speed dial frito-lay i I just thought that was something you did as an american you're kind of fucking with my head right now i didn't realize that until this very conversation Yeah, I, and 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 it was weird. My reality just just took a broadside right before we hit record, and I'm 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 kind of triggered, man. And but but there there are whole levels of of there are whole floors in Philippine call centers where they know if great unclean ones calling in, in the afternoon. Whoever gets that call, they're like, I'm good till the end of my shift because if if I find one of those fucked up little Cheetos, we're gonna we're gonna talk about what what that means at length. I hope you're making with, sure to with, send with those people uh, on the call center. I hope you're making sure to send everybody thank you cards. <laughs> you guys like you you like caught up on like what's going on with their kids. They're like, oh hey, did uh did little Johnny like is his uh is his baseball season going well? <laughs> it's like, yes, Mister Unclean One. <laughs> Johnny hit a home run the other day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, I suppose it is fine. <laughs> but uh, but but I so back back. So uh, apparently I'm not the only one. But th- that's good. So I, I feel like uh, I'm a little more you grounded. Ex- let's be was, honest. Yeah. You were expecting me to say no, weren't you? <laughs> I can tell I, you. Like- I just I, I didn't know what to expect. I just f- feel like a you know, person whose whole reality has been upended. I'm just I'm 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 f- flailing in the wreckage of the ship, looking for anything that you know not to sink. You're gonna call the Fritos hotline afterwards after this looking for that support that you need, right? You're going to call call them up, talk about your problems. They're going to walk you through it. Going to direct you to like some really nice homey like Frito recipe. You put like some chili cheese and some hamburger on top of some Fritos. Yeah, all I'm saying, Brendan talk Costello of Unchecked is 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 that it's it's a berserk century and you need to you need to have every tool at your disposal, including that number, to just keep keep uh, e- equilibrium. I think. But um, that was a weird intro. Back to the <laughs> podcast: board games, booze, hip hop. Uh, so Brendan uh, is one half of Unsheft. Uh, oh boy, was that loud! God damn it! What was... fucking email? Terrible. Okay gonna hit that again was in a couple Fritos? three <laughs> yeah, you, it, i always know it's them because the the subject line says i'm sorry um <laughs> mr unclean want, one we uh, miss you <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh you should see the palette of i'm sorry merchandise i have it in, in my garage t-shirts hats product it's beautiful um but uh so so tell you what brendan Man of the hour. Yes, um, 
I'm excited to have you on because I've listened to your podcast and I, I like what you talk about and how you and your co-host talk about it. Um, Brendan, you want to plug on Chef for a sec? Oh boy, I love plugging the I love plugging the show. Uh, so this kind of started during the pandemic. I think a lot of people had to, you know, readjust what they were doing with their lives during the pandemic. Chefs were hit particularly hard. Um, so I thought it would be fun to learn a COVID skill, and podcasting was the one that we landed on. And I got to talking with my roommate from the CIA about you know what it is to be a chef, you know, and we were kind of talking about how rough the landscape was for chefs and the more we talked about it the more we were like this is just how it's always been like being a chef has always been hard and we started talking about why it was hard and we started you know getting into all of these uh you know topics that take place in the kitchen like you know the the pay that you get as a chef isn't particularly high the amount of hours that you work uh are long you know, you don't get to spend a lot of time with your family because you're always on during holidays because when other people are off, that's when they want to go to restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. And uh, we both kind of, you know, realized we didn't really want to go back to chefing that badly, uh, given all the reasons I just gave you. So uh, that's where the name came from, Unchefed. And we started talking about all this stuff that people just weren't interested in. Like, why, why aren't we paying more, you know, more to... Uh, cooks on the line and it was something that people didn't really understand like they didn't get like what the what the reason that this was important to us or what what you know a fair wage for an employee would even be so the show became kind of like well what can we talk about that sort of puts people in the mind set to you know not only understand like these questions but kind of enjoy the process of coming to understand them you know what I mean so We've got episodes where we talk about like how, you know, the mob impacted the the dairy industry. We got one about like Indiana Jones, the guy well, the guy who was the model for Indiana Jones anyway, wanting to create a new form of meat in the country by farming hippos. You know, our recent one was on like supplements and how food can actually keep you healthy. Uh, so we, we kind of span the gamut. That was a long description. I apologize. Not trying to hijack you here. <laughs> no, no, no. That's 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 what we want you here to do. We're very passionate. This is something that's very important to us. It's it's fun to do, but like the more we do it, the more we're like, this is actually really interesting. This is actually like there's a lot of ways that food impacts our lives that, you know, are educational. They teach us about, you know, the country that we live in, the world we live in, how, you know, everything kind of interacts with each other. Like food is where business started. Like that's the original business. There's nothing that comes before that. Like somebody was like, I got a turnip. And another person was like, well, I guess I'll learn how to like carve this rock into something and give it to you. And then you'll give me that turnip and then I'll have some food. You know, like that's where, that's where business started was, and it's still the model for so much of what we do. And, you know, a lot of people don't think about this, but like basically everything you have came from the ground at one point or another. It's all synthesized. We built machines to turn turnips into computers. But at the end of the day, like the people that are growing the turnips are still <laughs> like they're still kind of running the world in a way that I don't think that a lot of people take the time to think about. And our show is kind of, you know, premised on this idea that if you took the time to think about it, you would actually enjoy it. You would enjoy thinking about things and seeing things that way. Absolutely. I'm making a note here. Um, I need to uh, make a turnip NFT. That's that's going to happen. Because I, I want to start. I want to start. It's like a potato battery. You know? I, I want to start. I want to start trading some very abstract turnip based financial vehicles. <laughs> I think there's and, a future the, in it. Like you might and, actually and, be be improving the world, right? I don't know about that, but we might we might get rich, dog. So coming up here, there's a couple there's a couple segments here we're gonna do today: board games, booze, hip hop, and and Brendan, who is very busy, has gamely agreed to ride along for all three episodes. He is going to introduce us to something I'm really excited to do for our drink of the week. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, Game of the week is something I've been exploring, which (laughs) Brendan's offered to be a sport about. And then Brendan's going to take over again for our track of the week. Um, We uh, talked a little bit before we hit record about why Brendan chose this song. And it's also an artist that nobody has come up and and featured. So that's going to be good stuff. Also, you're about to hear something before we go to Drink of the Week that you will never have heard on the show. You're about to hear 
a commercial for another podcast. This podcast is called Casting Views. It's by an uncle and uh, his nephew in the UK. And they're just two kind of smart guys who know a little bit about a lot of different stuff. And they talk about it. Here comes the ad. I'm Dan. I'm Lou. And together we are Casting Views. An uncle and nephew chatting on random topics. Some heavy, some fun, but we aim to amuse. Don't miss out, don't delay. Subscribe to Casting Views today. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor and Good Pods. And thank you to the gentlemen at Casting Views. I was listening to a little bit of their episode on uh, scams and frauds. And um, at first I was skeptical, then I sort of, I don't know whether it's... Do, do you find when you're listening to people from... The, they win you over, don't they? They, they win you over. Oh my God. Uh, first of all, they're, they're, they're wry without ever punching down. They have a sense of humor right. about the world. They know a little bit about a lot of stuff. They have mellifluous voices. And because I'm an American, when I hear that accent, I automatically assume that they're 10% more credible. You're going to make that comment. I think that's, a, I think that's right. I think, I think that, that it depends on the kind of person you are. I think that some people hear uh, an accent and they're like, well, that's different. They've got to know things that I don't know. And other people hear it and they're like, that sounds different. I don't like it. You know, and I think that both of us kind of fall in the former camp where we hear it and we're like, what else do you, I, what do you know? <laughs> like, what do you... A, a, lot of, a lot of their knowledge comes from their daily ex- experience. And you can tell, of course, they're, uh, they're, both, they're both sharp too, but, but, um, but they're disarming. And, and they sort of, in an anecdotal way, sort of walk their way through a topic. And it was sort of refreshing being that, and I'm the first perpetrator of this. I'm always thinking of like, oh, how do I make a really jarring, edgy, cold open and da 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 and go for uh, setups and laugh lines. And, and at the charm of, I, I wanted to go and just sit in a pub while, while these guys held forth. And, and that, that was the vibe. And, and uh, one of the reasons I didn't get to review your track of the week before this, because I was on minute 25 of their show. It was like, this isn't bad. I like it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> casting views. Uh, and that also, um, uh, Brendan of Unchefed sort of roped together a little uh, flotilla of indie podcasts such as ours, and we're all trading ads. So you're going to hear um, my ads and other podcasts and, uh, and, and other worthy little ventures on the microphone that you haven't heard but you should have heard in ads in future episodes. So thank you for putting that together, Brendan. It's a lot of fun. I believe in the, the indie podcasting community. I, think, I mean, it's a lot of fun. You have fun doing this, right? I certainly have fun doing my show. Uh, we know that casting views they have a have a good time doing theirs. So I guess there's this uh, inclusionary thing that I think really matters to you, me, and everyone who's involved with this. Yeah, I, I think you can tell by the nature of the, the the Twitter thread that people are engaged and and like the camaraderie, and and appreciate the fact that sure. you know. Imagine you're a bat flying through, and you just keep pinging, pinging, pinging. And you're, nothing's coming back. It's like, where am I flying? So back in a moment with drink of the week. Drink of the week. So drink of the week. I, I have a parallel between gameplay and the and the drink you picked, uh, sure. Brendan, because you're a, a, a you're a trained chef, and that's right. When I saw the list of ingredients for what you wanted to do this week, part of my brain kind of noped out. And then I finally realized why so many of of the people that I try to tell about the strategy games I play also nope out because they they see all that profusion and all those dials and trackers and pieces on the table and it just shut down. Their brain just goes, "Uh." (laughs) I I think probably 85% of my choices in life can probably be traced back to complexity avoidance. Yeah, I would uh, I would say that that's probably a pretty common thing. People like you don't. What this is an old. I used to be a philosophy nerd. This is one of those old philosophy things. You aren't able to recognize things that you don't understand. Like they just kind of graze over. I think I was like Plato or some shit. I'm just trying to sound smart. I want people to like me. <laughs> it's it's sad, really. <laughs> I, I, I have i have the same affliction that's why we're both here uh, question um we're gonna make a hot toddy and and in, in a particular it's called the money gun hot toddy do you want to well i'm you have the floor man this is this is your segment now and your drink well it's uh it's actually i did have my own hot toddy that i did at a restaurant in brooklyn several years ago but i couldn't find it anywhere it's 
there's just boxes all over my place right now. So instead, I got a Bon Appetit recipe that I've made several times. Like I said, it's the Money Gun Hot Toddy. It's not a traditional hot toddy. Traditional hot toddy is, uh, you know, basically some variation of tea and whiskey and lemon, you know. Um, and this one is a little different because it uses dark rum and cognac, which uh, I like. I'm a fan of. I like. I like kind of you know veering from the from the expected path a little bit. So I've made this one before. It uses. I think the thing that was probably freaking you out is it uses a little bit of ginger and a little bit of clove. Now neither of these things are that rare. Neither one's that expensive. You know, it's uh, it's actually you just cut up a little bit of ginger, throw it into a mug, crush it add like a little couple pieces of clove which you know they smell like hot topic cigarettes um i think most people are going to know that reference i think the clove cigarettes um it, it, the official smell of the 1980s hardcore scene <laughs> yeah uh, this is like a perfect circle concert back in the early aughts <laughs> um yeah it's like you, you get a whiff of that and you're like is seven seconds around here somewhere <laughs> um but yeah, you just throw but, a little bit of hot water know, uh, on top of that and then let it sit for four minutes and then add some honey and some lemon juice and then the, the booze. And then you got a nice warm drink that's supposed to be kind of medicinal, soothing for your throat. I'll, I'll You know, I'll, I'll take it. And, uh, you know, in terms of yeah, low immune systems, low spirits, I'm feeling like accepting the, the complexity of this mission is going to be rewarding. And to take the analogy, Brendan, full, cir <laughs> full circle, the reason why I you invest the extra night into maybe, you know, learning one of these complex games is because it's rewarding and has nuances that you're not going to get anywhere else. That being said, um, I got it. I got some ginger to peel. I got some water to heat up, my friend. <laughs> going to, uh, coach you through this we're gonna we're gonna make it through okay. together absolutely so tell you what uh i'm gonna be off screen and off mic for a moment i'm gonna uh mince up a little you know little like a what what teaspoon tablespoon that's not much i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, mix up i'm gonna tell you right now i'm gonna give you a i'm gonna give you a pointer i'm gonna make this easier if you want to peel it use a spoon just like scrape it with a spoon it's gonna peel really quickly then just take like something flat and just like put it on top of the ginger, smack it down real quick to kind of crush it. Done. Don't worry about it being an exact tablespoon. Oh, oh you mean, are you telling me I don't, I don't even have to mince it? Less. No, not, absolutely not. Dope. All right, I'm going to get some water on the What will happen if you... If you... Go, by the way, yeah. you can keep talking. I can hear you. Gotcha. Yeah, so if you mince it, it's going to put more ginger flavor into the water faster. But, you know, I just use a little bit more ginger and crush it. It still comes out completely fine, and it's less of a headache. You know, I'm, I'm with you. I don't want to, like, mince ginger for a drink while I'm at home. <laughs> you know, The best thing to do, I think, with toddy is to make, like, a big batch. You know, you actually get a lot of ginger, crush it up put it in your water, boil the water with the ginger, throw a couple cloves in, and then use that hot water afterwards, like strain everything out, and then, you know, kind of make like a big batch. That's, that's what toddies are for. They're really social. It's like a winter, it's a winter beverage. And I think traditionally, or like a mold cider, that's like whenever you think winter drinks, that's usually what you go for. And the reason for that is you tend to get like once you get inside, you stay inside because it's it's freaking cold out. you know. So uh, generally you have a bunch of people. This was historically the more people you have in one place, the more you're saving resources. Like, you know, the number of people in a room will warm up the room a little bit. You're like kind of mutually relying on each other's body temperatures. So and that's that's why like winter winter drinks have a tendency to be a bit big like they're they're more communal for that reason which is why they're usually very easy to batch out several minutes pass as the great unclean one fumbles and bashes his way through the kitchen in an ugly approximation of what people in the civilized world call bartending back to the night of i have uh, given this concoction a few minutes to steep so i'm uh, brendan i'm going to give you the I'm going to give you the Breakup Gaming Society toast. May you fight long and well. Toast. Cheers. May you fight long and well. Mm. <laughs> Do you feel healthier? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. About, 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 uh, throat. <laughs> in, in three hours, I'm going to be super healthy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I was getting healthy uh, about an hour before <laughs> the show started, so feeling pretty he- feeling pretty healthy myself. <laughs> I, I messed up a step, bro. I didn't strain it. I still have that whole chunk of ginger sitting in the bottom. <laughs> I don't think you're supposed to do that. Uh, yeah. I mean, you get a straw, but like, I don't think you want to drink a hot drink with a straw. <laughs> the straining is definitely a component of the uh, the recipe that I wouldn't omit. There's a lot of liberties taken with the recipe, but that's one that I would I would hold to. Yeah, I completely forgot like what I was doing because of you know short term memory failings, and I saw this <laughs> this oblique. Because of how healthy you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's me, Cheers. Mr. Clean Liv, Mr. Clean Living. Salute. So this has been the preparation and discussion of the Money Gun Hot Toddy, recommended to us and directed for us by Brendan Costello of Unchef.com. We're going to be back in a moment with Game of the Week. Sit tight. Game of the Week. First of all, I want to shout out, his name's Jason. Um, he goes by, under Twitter handle, I think it's called A Deck of 51. He is one of the most prolific reviewers of solo board games on Board Game Geek. And I guess on Board Game Geek, which is like the mother of all repository for commentary and document- documentation of board games, is sort of it. And he's a very thoughtful guy really drills into solo games why solo games i'm the new kid in town i've moved into a semi-rural area uh on the heels of a failed marriage and my board game group is gone so i'm like i started reading jason's reviews i'm like during the cold dark short days maybe having some really good meaty solo games would be fun so based on his rankings i bought a game called 1066 tears to many mothers it's based on the Norman invasion of England in, in that year when Duke William of Normandy brought, I don't know, hundreds of ships across the channel, landed uh, uh, near Hastings I think, or, or Pevensey, Senlac Hill, I, I get them all mixed up, and and beat the, the English, the Saxon force, um, headed up by Harold Godwinson, and, and, and had himself crowned king of Westminster Abbey in Westminster Abbey that Christmas. And uh, interesting... You know those little pieces of, wow, that's a timely nugget. So, Brendan, I'm reading some random thread on Twitter. And some big British billionaire died recently. And they were, it was a leftist subreddit. So they were making fun of and gloating about his death, of course. And they put, they published a quote for him saying, what's the secret to your success? He's like, he goes, it really helps to have a great, great, great uncle who played nice with William. (laughs) And as it turns out, some like research team at one of the big colleges over there actually did a, a study of all these sort of rare, not too often used surnames in England and found that actually the families that realized the Saxon regime was done and read the writing on the wall and stuck their tongue up uh, the new king's butt are actually all still extremely wealthy and prosperous to this day. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't surprise me. That was a big part of why this country exists is uh, eschewing the peerage system of England. You know, that's a, that's a, colonialist tradition as it turns out it's like letting people get rich and then not letting anybody other than those people get rich ever again <laughs> right clubs closed so sorry um so <laughs> yep we got enough rich people you all go be impoverished and work your asses off what, why don't you go over why don't you go sit- in front of- <laughs> why don't you go sit over there the uh, upper middle class looks nice doesn't it plenty plenty of room in those bleachers yeah. So, um, yeah. in the, so, so briefly to the game, um, Brendan, it, it's meant to be a two player experience, but it has a whole separate rule book that walks you through how to play it by yourself. And you pick, you pick a side, you you say, I want to be the Saxons or the Normans. And you get a big deck of cards that represents various, uh, actual, like we're alive in the day kinds of units, 
prominent nobles, people who are on the battlefield that day. And like the game Magic the Gathering, you sort of have to beat the other person's deck. Except every card in here is taken from some actual inflection point in the battle or some intrigue that led up to the battle. Such as, you know, uh, I think it was the English king's, one of his butthurt brothers or sister, you know, sisters who went over to the, <laughs> the Danes and encouraged them to invade. And anyway, um, you realize that, you know, uh, what was his name? George R. R. Martin didn't have to strain that hard to imagine a world like this. It's all here. The, the treachery no, and wasn't the combat. That, uh, wasn't, wasn't the Lord of the Rings, like... No, I'm thinking of Game of Thrones was, like, the War of the Roses, essentially. Th- like, that that's what I'm like, talking about. That's what yeah. I was put down on. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think Lord of the Rings is probably even more <laughs> keeping in keeping in uh, in theme with the with the old English dyna- like dynastic battles and yeah. I see you. I feel yeah. you. Yeah, this yeah, this stuff this stuff was not not plucked from uh, alien dreamscapes. <laughs> uh, uh, so <laughs> but in in, in essence you, you have a deck from which you get you know, various cards and you have to uh, deploy and manipulate your cards in such a way that you achieve one of two objectives. Um, you, you sort of line your cards, cards up on the, on the table in what are called wedges, which represent the key formations of the day. And, and you try to assign damage with your card's action to those wedges. Break two of the enemy wedges or kill their boss and you've won. So if you've ever wanted to restage the Battle of Hastings or... Maybe the, the Saxons, a.k.a. the English, come out on top. You can give it a try. I have been walking through the solo rules at a very slow pace. I've had this game on my table for a week, and it seems really neat. Um, elements of it harken back to Warhammer, Warhammer 40,000 Conquest in terms of having um, a, a deck a deck fighting against deck strategy concept that also has a sort of thematic being played in a certain place element to it in that you have to be able to muster archers and uh, shield walls here and there across all three wedges you know you don't have the luxury of just slamming cards down in one spot till the other person gets 20 damage and you win they, they do it to sort of reenact some of the, the nuances of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy that's why i got Did out of magic that's why i got out of magic i was i, I love the concept of magic i liked playing it back in the day but i, I think it was i can't even remember the the expansion that came out when people started like basically all you do is spam now like that's it like if you're not spamming you're losing (laughs) and the people that had like all the money to invest in their decks could like hyper spam (laughs) and you know i'm just over there like i got i I put 20 bucks into my deck i'm gonna have a good time (laughs) and then just get like destroyed anyways i'm sorry so i i digress that's not a digression at all as a matter of fact I can't. It might have been episode forty-six. It's one of the ones I did solo and sober, which is a rarity. But I talked about um, so never again. That, <laughs> the, the Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon and Magic are all what they call the the collectible card game model, where and basically it's pretty exploitative of its players. And um, yeah, and right. fantasy fantasy flight took a huge step up in sort of the ethics and playability of these kind of games when they came out with what they call the LCG, the living card game. And they rolled out with some for Warhammer, uh, Game of Thrones, Arkham Horror, Netrunner was a huge one before they folded it, all taking place in different things. But in an LCG, Race for the Galaxy. Oh, yeah, um, that's a set collection game, which for some reason, the day we tried to learn that, I was so hungover, I just didn't get it. I didn't have not one synapse in my brain that was firing. And I think we sat at my friend Jay's table for two and a half hours. I don't think I got through a turn. It's weird. It's just one of those things. But in, in either case, I want to thank uh, Jason, Jason Moore, Twitter, a deck of 51 for being just a really thoughtful, rigorous and, and uh, explorer of solo game experiences and has offered, you know, on his suggestion, I've, undertaken what seems to be a pretty rewarding experience after I actually get through a game, get a, a better sense of how to resolve all the combat and what the late game looks like. I might have a different view, but so far I dig it and it's historical as hell. <laughs> historical as hell. You heard it here first. <laughs> the, the game of the week. Screw it. Let's over. I want to, I want to hear what my guest wants to spin on track of the week. See you in just a couple.
Relax and take a seat, sit back and play the beats And blast it in your Jeep, it's the track of the week I'm ratchet in the streets, talk trash to the geeks Get smacked in the beat, it's the track of the week Having patiently sat through as I stammered my way through the description of a card game about the Battle of Hastings in the year 1066, we now give the floor back hell. again to... <laughs> it's, yeah, that's, that's the, the, the phrase that kept you know, ringing through my head. It's like, historical, this is so crazy. And the, and the next thing I know, I'd be halfway up the ridge next to my house, just you know, half-dressed. It's like, God, that's historical. So historical. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but now we're getting back come back with us to the land of track of the week where our host Brendan is going to pick out a track for us Brendan what are we going to hear so I had the great fortune of seeing people under the stairs live before the um, unfortunate passing of Double K during the pandemic and it was really hard for me to pick one track that I thought sort of summarized what it is that I like about people under the stairs. When I saw them live, I think my favorite part about it was I, I always thought that this one was a good lyricist, but seeing him live, he's just got this amazing flow to him. He's got this, uh, this cadence. It's, uh, he's got this energy. Like he's really good at getting the, getting the crowd hyped up and double K is every bit the DJ that this one is uh, the front man. Uh, I, the most incredible thing that I, I think I saw that night was Double K behind the turntables. Uh, and he's, you know, he's setting up the track, he's setting up his beat, and then he stops and he comes up and he's just perfectly in flow rapping alongside this one. And as soon as his, like, you know, verse starts to end, he starts backing up to the table and he makes it right back the second he's got to change the beat for the next song. And you realize that as the two of them were rapping together, he was keeping this one, you know, in his rhythm and he was keeping an internal rhythm for when he needed to change the track simultaneously. And he was also aware of where he was on stage. And it was just this, this, I, perception that he had of the entire process of making music that I had this respect for so I was trying to think of something that really typified what it is that I liked about this band I realized that that wasn't that wasn't it it wasn't just that they were amazing musicians amazing hip-hop artists it's also that they're fun you know it's just a it's a fun band so the track that I selected for your show was uh, off of OST which is my favorite I think favorite album that they did it stands for original soundtrack and the song is the joyride because it's just a fun song like and that's kind of what it's about they're just joyriding <laughs> you know um i think that lyrically uh that's one's doing exactly what uh he does he's just he's just an amazing lyricist he's an amazing front man he's good at vocals good at flowing uh, of course, Double K again, like he puts his own beats down and that's part of what the song is about is like you guys out there who are in the hip hop space, you're kind of coming across like you've made all these all these beats yourself and you didn't and they did like they, they did. And that was a huge call out at the time because this was this was something and it's and, you know, I think it was kind of racial racially based like. A lot of white people would just get upset. It's like, oh, rap, there's no skill to it because people are just taking other songs and sampling them and they're not making their own oh, stuff. Oh, boy. Which was, first off, I want to disassociate myself from those clowns. Like, hip-hop has always been this, like, I've always thought that there's just so much talent going through it. It's it's an amazing art form. And there's just, it's so layered. There's so much going on, not just, like, musically, but socially. But that was something I think that they were kind of, tapping into uh and you know they're not pointing anybody out specifically so much as they're using the art form to express the fact that they are creating everything that you're hearing from scratch they're putting the work in they're putting the time in and this amazing track that you were listening to right now currently was their blood sweat and tears and instead of accusing the listener of making these vile and odious claims about how they don't have talent because all they're doing is sampling other people's stuff. Instead of accusing the listener, they take the listener on this joyride where they're making fun of some, like, you know, fictitious person 
that you know obviously isn't getting offended by any of this because they're fictitious <laughs> you know and distancing themselves from this thought that was popular in you know the world at this at this time the the per, you know the perception of hip-hop they're distancing themselves from this idea that they're not putting the work in when they were and you know i just i think that this song perfectly encapsulates a lot of what i like about hip-hop not just from that era but in general and it's coming from one of my favorite artists within that space i'm sold tell you what brandon let's check out the way it drops sure let's do it I'm glad you, you, you brought up this band, one, this act, because nobody on the on the show has, has spotlighted people under the stairs before tonight, and, and they certainly deserve it. I'm not as familiar with their body of work as you, although on you know my various algorithm-led explorations, my favorite by them that everything has come up. I love uh, San Francisco Nights. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they played that one at the show I was at. Which was which was great. Like I love the show, but like I think me and my wife were the only ones that were like actually dancing and having a good time. At one point, we stop and we look around, and you know it was like the whole crowd was white. It was just a bunch of white boys, and uh, which you know there's I don't think that that's inherently problematic. Uh, you know, like it's not bad to have like a bunch of white people at a show. You know, I'm not I'm not one of those like I am I'm left of center, but like I'm not one of those crazy leftists. It's like whenever you have too many white people, it's bad. But I do think that one of the things that I noticed was they all looked like they were trying to solve a math problem and they weren't like having a good time you know like they're all just sitting there like hmm yes this is technically good rap <laughs> and, and me and my wife are just like kind of going crazy and at one point that's one like he kind of identified us as the people that were like really actually enjoying it and getting into it and he had this little soundboard that looked like a, an old uh, joystick with like all the buttons that had like a bunch of different sound effects looped to each of them and he starts playing it on my wife head and I have that video where he's like doing this like beatboxing and rapping and using this like little device and he's like playing it on her head oh and fantastic and, yeah, and yeah it, it was a lot of fun and, and he's, it is, it's finally you know, to his instincts probably a relief like oh good somebody somebody's moving that, that's what <laughs> yeah it was with everyone with everyone like sparring about their goat lists and everything all that you, and I, I I still try to turn my mom onto it, but she listens at the music and like, mom, it's a party. Hip hop is a fucking party. I'm right. sucking niggas paper beats when they claiming that they making them, but we know that they making them. You tell them what we making them. Get fucked up. I throw them in the trunk with the pump chunk. Drop them at the dump and leave them numbed up with my one man gang. Cause me and double bring pain like a window. I'm no one like a kid on a Nintendo. Yeah, you got to enjoy yourself a little bit, you know, like I think the I think the venue that we saw them in, like, I don't really care if nobody else is enjoying themselves. I don't need them to in order for me to enjoy myself. Uh, it was a little unfortunate. It was kind of a little gentrified of an area in Brooklyn, which uh, I think I think, you know, not to get too political, but I think gentrification is just like economic violence, full stop. Like, that's just what it is. Um, uh, you I wouldn't just want to get too political, but hell, hell, hell but, no. Um, um, if, if, you, if you ever gone back and I think I let myself rant for six minutes in a very vehement way but uh, you're giving you're giving me a flashback and sometimes it's generational because from what I can tell a lot of the the white Brooklyn kind of kids who will name drop bands like that they're only repeating stuff they read on fucking pitchfork they don't know the music yeah they don't care. they don't care about it that much and and here's and um, and plus there's also it's also a generational thing. You're not going to feel that, you know, unless you like were high with your friends and you were 21, you heard it on that day. You're just never going to see it the same way. And you remind yeah. me of when the, the, the Pixies reformed around 2003 and and went on tour. And I got into them after they broke up in 91 or so. And yeah. I was like, I get to see the Pixies, like all original lineup. No way. And we went to. And you know we were in our you know mid thirties around here, and we partied hard that night. We were ready, and we uh, it was at a venue on the DU campus, 
And I remember, you know, sitting, we were side of stage, you know, several rows up, but good view, it was a small venue. And they break into debaser. And that dun 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 oh, dun yeah. dun bass line starts up and we got up mm-hmm. and we're just up out of our seats, bouncing around like lunatics. I'm finally seeing debaser live, and then back of us are like these twenty two year olds going, Sit down, sit down. I'm like <laughs> fuck you. Fuck. <laughs> fuck this. I'm like, this is debaser, you fucking test tube baby. <laughs> nice. I had a semi-similar experience when Jane's Addiction got back together. That was uh, that was kind of my... I never got to see the Pixies live, unfortunately. I'm a huge fan of the Pixies. Um, I, I, was all, I also became a fan of them after they broke up. Um, but a little bit later, a little bit later in life. But Jane's Addiction, I was always a fan of. And when they got back together, I was like, no shit! And I got to see them at Lollapalooza, and I had a similar, like, what the fuck? Like, I, like, it was just out of my mind. Like, it was something that was never going to happen, because they were done. They were gone. And then they were back, and I got to see them, and it was great. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and, it's, and it's your misfortune to be sitting next to some kids who are just there to be seen or have something to do or, you know, anyway. So, yeah. hey, this has been a, a track of the, uh, So if you want to hear the, the aggregate of all the choices that our cast and our thoughtful guests have made, uh, we keep a list on Spotify, Breakup Gaming Society, where we take all the tracks of the week that were featured in order, put them on there. Brendan, you're going in there. You're canonized, bro. Yeah. That's so, official. So, I, get so, the, I get the Breakup Gaming Society check mark. That's right. And also, do me a second favor and go over and find an episode of Unchefed and listen to it. Um, what these guys are up to is really thoughtful, really intelligent, and really engaging. And for me... It was a coup to be able to get onto your schedule tonight, and and thank you for setting us, setting us up on the platform, suggesting a good drink, good tracks, all that. You know, I'm happier than a pig and shit over here. <laughs> it's a pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Cool. Until then, this is the great unclean one saying, "May you fight long and well." You see, it was way simpler than you thought, right? <laughs>